This is Vicky Strachan from Strachan IP. And Vicky has agreed to spill the beans and share with you 10 things that your patent attorney is probably not telling you but that you really need to know. Do make sure you keep watching right until the end of this video because the last three tips are all about how you can minimize your costs during the process so that could save you thousands of pounds. So keep watching for that. Vicky, over to you. The first thing to say is that there are uh, plenty of people and companies claiming to be able to draft and file your UK patent application. Top tip, and all chartered patent attorneys will tell you this, but not all people claiming to be patent experts will tell you this, always use a chartered patent attorney to prepare and file your patent application. We go through a very rigorous qualification process post-graduation, so we have science degrees, and then we do four or five years training to be able to provide the service. The first patent application that you file for your invention is critical. It has to describe your invention fully and in a way that allows us then to claim the invention so that it's not too easy to design around and it takes a lot of time and experience to be able to do that to give you the best value. So always use a chartered patent attorney, that's my first top tip. The second one is always have a patentability search done first before you go down the patent route. It will give you an idea of what problems and obstacles you might face during the patenting process and it will enable you to offset them and mitigate them almost before you start. The results of a search can be brought into the patent drafting process so that they're problems that we won't have to deal with further down the line and therefore you can reduce your costs. Now this is certainly something that some attorneys will not tell you because I've worked with various clients who've come to us with a patent that they've had drafted and filed only to find that later on when the patent office does their own search that there's a kind of knockout patent and, and if they'd known about that they never would have paid for the drafting in the first place. That's right. And it's pretty awful really <laughs> that the attorney never told them about the possibility of searching before they did the draft. But I guess for some patent attorneys bidding targets and all that kind of thing just means that actually they'd rather bill for an expensive patent draft than they would for a patentability search. There's another point there and that is that a lot of attorneys will offer a transactional service. So if you go to them and say I want a patent application for this, they will give you a patent application for that without working with you to consider other options and what might be best for you at the stage of the business that you are at. In their defence you've asked them for a patent application so that's what you've got but it's important for your attorney especially for startups and smaller businesses to be a little bit more involved in your business and it will allow them to give you better advice but my advice is except in exceptional circumstances always have a patentability search done first it will save you a lot of trouble down the line even if it doesn't bring up a knockout document and even if you do ultimately go down the patent route the search will be useful and will help to reduce costs. That's great. So what's your next top piece of advice, Vicky, then, uh, that attorneys won't normally share? Always ask your patent attorney for a forecast of likely costs. Always. Ask them for a forecast of likely costs over the whole patent process. They'll tell you that they're estimates and they'll tell you that they're based on current fees and they will tell you that some costs will vary. But a good attorney should be able to give you a reasonable idea of what your costs are going to be from start to finish for a UK patent. And they will vary a little bit, but it will give you an idea and it will give you a budget figure. So make sure that you have a forecast of likely costs. Great tip. Okay, what's next? Okay, the next one is if you email or telephone your attorney, make sure that you ask them if they're going to charge you for answering your question or for speaking to you on the phone. If you're getting charged, if you're getting a bill for answers to simple questions or guidance through the process, if it, especially if it's your first time, then it might be worth considering changing your attorney. Yeah, and for people who do want to change your attorney, there's a link through to Vicky's company. It's in the description below. Vicky will quite happily have a free initial consultation with you to talk about what she can do for you and your idea. So do check that out. 
Okay, so another one, and in a similar vein, ask your patent attorney if they charge you for sending reminders for responding to examination reports, for example. If they do charge for sending reminders, consider putting the date in your own diary and asking your attorney to only send you one reminder close to the deadline. And that way you won't get a bill for a series of three, four, five reminders that might otherwise be issued. And again, another similar one is when a search or examination report is received, ask your attorney not to review it in any detail, not to spend any time on it until you ask them to. You do the first pass. You look at the documents that have been cited in relation to your invention and get it very clear in your head what is different about your invention and express that to your patent attorney so that they have a starting point so that half the work that they would otherwise have done has already been done by you. I think that's a critical point, isn't it? The, the attorney is only really charging official fees, which you can't do anything about. They are fixed and that's it, and your attorney can't change that. And the only other thing they can charge you for, really, is, is their time. As the applicant, if you want to minimise your costs, you really need to minimise the time your attorney needs to spend on the application in the first place, but then also, as you say, in responding to search reports or anything else. Yeah, if you can do the first pass, you are going to save your attorney time and therefore you are going to save yourself some cost. Okay, great. That's really helpful. Another top tip, a UK patent application must be filed before there's any public disclosure of your invention. However, if you can delay filing your patent application as long as possible and up to the point where you simply can't get away without disclosing your invention. So you can use NDAs with trusted potential investors, manufacturers, people like Phil here, but at the point where you cannot keep it confidential anymore, that's the point to file the patent application. So the later that you can file your patent application, the longer you can defer all the costs of filing the UK patent application and subsequently any overseas applications. So I guess in terms of keeping your costs low, what you're doing is just delaying a subsequent cost as much as possible. So a lot of our clients, I guess, say, I want a patent, I want to patent it as soon as possible because otherwise someone else might do it first. But actually all you're doing is bringing forward all those other costs in the process. And actually, sometimes it's best to leave it until the absolute last minute before you then, I don't know, go and take your product to an exhibition where you're never going to be able to get everyone to sign an NDA. That's right. So at that point, you have to patent it and, and you do it then rather than any sooner. Yeah, absolutely. Because the nearer you are to revenue generating mm. in relation to that piece of technology, whether you're a startup or an existing business, the closer you are to making money from that invention when you file your patent application, the better. Because ideally, your revenue stream will ultimately fund your patent process yeah. and you're not trying to find it out of potentially limited resources yeah. at the start of the project. Just before Vicky shares her next tip, please do hit like and subscribe if you're getting value out of this video. Also, Vicky and I have written a couple of different PDFs. Please check them out in the description below. They're entirely free to download and will give you a whole load of additional benefit and advice to help you panting your idea. Always thoroughly review any search or examination report that's issued in relation to your patent application. They will always have a list of what's called prior art, which is just documents that have been cited by the examiner as being relevant to your invention. Again, if you do that first pass, clearly express to your patent attorney exactly what it is that's different and better about your invention in relation to what's been cited in these reports, then it will cut the number of hours that they need to spend by quite a significant amount. Okay. And would it also be fair to say that actually if you keep your communication time with your attorney down, then you're likely to end up with lower bills as well? Because we all know that there's some clients who talk for England and that therefore your time is money, any attorney's time is money, and therefore I guess if your communication is and precise with your attorney, then that's likely to help keep your costs minimised as well. Certainly in relation to things like examination reports where a response needs to be filed, if your attorney has to um, go through um, 10, 12 pages of rambling 
um, then that's going to take time. Mm -hmm. But I was going to say yes and no in relation to this, (laughs) because yes, if you can minimize the time the attorney needs to spend in formulating a response to an examination report, it's going to keep your costs low. However, in terms of communicating with your attorney, it's important that you have a line of communication that allows you to speak and ask questions without getting a bill every time you pick up the phone. So there's a yes and no answer (laughs) there, really, Phil. So uh, I think the tip then is choose an attorney who isn't going to charge you for every kind of six minutes on the clock that you spend talking to them about your application in the process. I would definitely advise that. (laughs) Okay. It's not unusual for various patents, either in the UK or overseas, um, to become less less valuable and relevant to your business as it grows and evolves. So there might have been, uh, you might have improved the product and already have a new patent application for the improved product, or you may have a a different product altogether, or that product might be um, reducing in sales as other products are increasing in sales. It's important to keep on top of the intellectual property of the patents that are covering these various product lines. And as they become less valuable to the business, decisions need to be made as to whether or not to keep those patents and patent applications alive. I have, over the years, often taken on clients who have massive portfolios of patents, some of the patents being for products that are now obsolete, that have been superseded, but because they didn't have a sort of a handle on their patent portfolio and how it matched up to their various products. When they received a reminder or when they received a letter from their attorney, they were simply allowing those patents and patent applications to continue because they didn't know what else to do. There was no other options. So one thing a patent attorney may never tell you is that you're under no obligation just because you've started a process you're under no obligation to continue it you can stop it at any point in the process whether that be uh, a patent a granted patent that's being renewed year on year you don't have to renew it you can let it lapse if you want to but a patent application if it gets to a point where you have to spend money on it you can decide at that point if it's worth spending money on it whether or not you're actually making money from that product in that country. So it's quite important to have a good handle on what patents cover what, which ones are still valuable to the company and which are not, and what you're going to do at each cost point in relation to those patents. And so if a viewer has a patent portfolio and wants to go through that process and analyse and and create a patent strategy, then they could get in touch with you at your company and you'd help them go through that process. Absolutely. We've done that for a lot of clients. So we have an IP management and strategy package, if you like, whereby we will help you to organise everything in a way that enables you to make those decisions advisedly, if you like. Yeah, Yeah. because I guess a lot of attorneys will just keep sending the reminders and just keep... They will, and we are taught from a very early age that, you know, to err on the side of caution. So if we don't receive a response from you, we will uh, usually, for safety, maintain your patent rights for you and send you a bill uh, for the privilege. Um, But... In an ideal world, your attorney will be helping you to make those decisions by understanding how these various intellectual property rights match up to your products, to your product line, to your commercial plans, and to your revenue stream. Yeah, very sensible advice. Okay, have you got anything else for us in terms of what attorneys would not normally tell you? Many attorneys will tell you this, but I'm guessing it's not that standard. It's very important to mark your patented products on Mm. the packaging, on the product itself, on your website, wherever you can get it in. Make sure you've got your patent or patent application numbers somewhere visible to let people know that the product has a patent on it. There's two reasons. The big one for me is that most scrupulous competitors, they won't knowingly infringe your patent. Patents are expensive to infringe, so they will steer clear if they know. And if they're deterred, then it saves you the cost of having to stop them if they do infringe your patent. 
The second is, and it's lesser known, is that if you haven't marked your products and you ultimately take somebody to court for infringement, they can claim what's known as innocent infringement and it can have a and it can reduce the damages that you would ultimately be rewarded if you're successful. Now hopefully you found that video useful. Vicky and I have done another video which is titled The Cost of Not Applying for a Patent. You ought to check that one out straight away. Here's the link. We'll see you there.